So welcome. Um, this is the third peer learning circle in a series that's been focused on evaluation. So th today's topic is getting the most from your data and your findings. So once you collect the data, what do you do with it? Um, the, the peer learning circles are a different format from our usual core institute events. They're more of a conversation where we can all share uh, tips and learn from each other. And so Jane Conklin is going to be facilitating that discussion for us today. And so uh, I'm co-hosting this event. I'm Nicole Young. I'm one of the consultants that facilitates a countywide initiative called Core Investments. And Jane Conklin is one of the members of our core consulting team who is also an expert in evaluation and has been hosting these peer learning circles for us. Uh, we do have simultaneous interpretation provided by Oscar Rios today. And then Gisela Carrasco is providing bilingual support during the meeting as well. Okay. Um, so let me just give a brief overview of core investments. I know some of you might already know this, but again, we like to uh, cover it each time we do an event like this. So core stands for the collective of results and evidence-based investments. And we think of it both as a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And over the years, through it, with a lot of collaborative discussions and conversations, we've arrived at this mission and vision statement for core investments that are really part of the foundation of the core framework. And so you'll notice words like collective action, safe, healthy community, equity, it's front and center. We want to share the responsibility for achieving that mission and that vision, and that we're thinking about health and well-being of all people at every stage of life. And when we talk about the core framework, another uh, key piece of that is what we call the core conditions for health and well-being. Um, some of you might be familiar with these. Whoops. And. Uh, if you're not, just keep an eye out for future opportunities where we'll be doing more um, focused training and technical assistance on these core conditions for health and well-being, really defining what they mean, how to identify and look at data or indicators that tell us about how are we doing as a community in these eight different dimensions of well-being. Uh, do we see any patterns around the presence or absence of well-being? Uh, in certain core conditions or certain areas of our county or certain populations within our county. Um, and one of the things that we emphasize about the core conditions is just how interconnected they are. That when we look at health and wellness, and again, either the presence of well being or disparities in well being when it comes to health and wellness, that we have to keep asking ourselves, like, the, you know, the five whys. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Uh, and often what that leads to are um, connections or deeper understanding of the relationship between, for instance, economic security and social mobility with health and wellness or stable, affordable housing and shelter to health and wellness. Um, and so all of these you can see are connected. And we keep equity at the center of all this to remind ourselves that to fulfill, again, that mission and vision of core investments with equity at the center, we really have to continue to look at things like our programs, our policies, our practices. How are those either contributing to equitable health and well-being in these eight interconnected core conditions, or how might they be actually getting in the way of and serving as the barriers to equitable health and well-being. And events like today's peer learning circle are offered through the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So just think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of the broader Core Investments Initiative. And this is really our opportunity and space to offer training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities like this. 
for people from all different sectors and all different roles um, and, you know, to build some common language, build some shared skills and tools uh, to be able to fulfill that collective vision that I described earlier for core investments. And so with that, I'm actually going to stop my screen sharing and I'm going to pass it off to Jane, who's going to lead us through our discussion today. Thanks, Nicole. And um, let me add my welcome to everyone else's. It's great that people have carved some time out of their day to talk about evaluation, which is one of my favorite subjects. And so since we are trying to have a conversation together in this peer learning circle, I wanted to invite uh, people who join to just maybe come off mic and say, introduce themselves and ask, say if there's a specific question that they have or more generally what brought them in today. And I can just call on people in order in my screen. So people that are not on the core team, um, Teresa you're, or Teresa, you're first. So can you come off mic and just tell us a little bit about any burning questions you have or what brought you in today? So my name is Teresa Holman and I'm a private grant writing consultant for uh, Your Future Is Our Business. So I'm gonna write their program and it comes out on June 3rd. And I was previously working for a nonprofit organization and I saw these classes keep coming through my email. Okay, I wish I could go to these classes because oh, like, I have my degree, I'm a sociology major. So data, statistics, research, that is my jam. So I've learned to embrace my inner geek. That is my jam. I saw this class, I was like, I get to attend and it's like my favorite one and uh, be with more like-minded people. Most people, if this is not your jam, you won't be on this particular. So, oh, yeah, fantastic. So fantastic. I welcome that energy. I love it. So, um, and then Liz, you are right next door on my screen. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, you guys. Um, I'm Liz DePoit, and um, I'm the director at Safe Families for Children here. And my intern, Julia, is listening in, too. Um, and what else? Just why we're here? Is that what Jay said? Um, I why just... you're here? Any question that you have that you'd like to discuss with the group today? I don't have anything on my mind um, ahead of time as to what I need to discuss, but um, I just always, um, you know, gain wisdom and connection at these groups. So try and jump on as many as I can. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to both. Um, okay. And then Eva. if you would mind introducing yourself and letting us know if you have a particular question. And, okay, we may be on mute um, for Eva. So uh, let's see, we have one more person joining us. Hi, Jane and everyone. Sorry, just mic issues. Um, I'm happy to be here in this room with all these brilliant minds. Um, my name is Eva, and I'm a social impact consultant based here in Santa Cruz. And um, one of the hats that I have is the project coordinator for Data Share Santa Cruz County, which is a public health data platform. Um, and um, I feel like I always learn something in these conversations, even though I feel like I've been doing the ins and outs of this all the time, but just being inundated with data and how to look at it better and um, how to think more clearly about how to communicate um, all of the important um, measurements that we're looking at. Um, I, I feel like I can always learn something else. So that is what brought me here today. Great, thanks, Eva. And we probably will have all sorts of questions for you too about data share. It's such a great resource in Santa Cruz. County. And I think there was somebody else, but they may not have been able to successfully join. Is that right? Did I miss anybody? It looks like Gabriella dropped off. Okay. There might've been some audio issues. 
Okay. And then uh, we're going to start, um, it sounds like people have kind of general ideas. So we'll start with um, interest in learning. So I'm going to present just two slides and Liz, you'll recognize these two slides. So the only thing that's a repeat, I think you were at an earlier session. So I want to just get us kind of grounded in a shared evaluation definition. And there are many, many definitions out there. This is one I like. It's um, from Better Evaluation Organization. Org, and they do have a lot of resources. So anything on evaluation, um, you can find links to just an abundance of resources. But this particular definition um, focuses on any systematic process to judge merit, worth, or significance. So, that, so there's that value and assessment piece right in the middle by combining evidence. Um, we've talked already about data and values. And that last piece around combining evidence and values is another thing I like about this particular definition. I think it suits core really well, particularly if we think about equity, inclusion, those pieces, we can build those right into our evaluation. Um, for example, how we engage stakeholders, what, how we think about outcomes, um, framing evaluation questions, collecting evidence, or even what counts as evidence, all those things can be very values laden. And so um, I just like kind of uh, surfacing those ideas as well when we think about evaluation. And then finally, even though this definition feels a little bit academic, evaluation doesn't necessarily need to be academic, right? It can also be like this idea of evaluative thinking that you infuse into your programs and kind of assessing how well you're doing by thinking about evidence in particular ways, having that curiosity. So, okay, the next slide. Um, this one is an evaluation framework. Um, and again, there are so many approaches out there. Um, I really like this one. This one was developed by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It's originally a public health framework, but I think it's adaptable and scalable to any context. And I would say for me, one of my lessons learned as an evaluator was kind of coming into the process. I usually would inherit things from predecessors and I just kind of dive in and do data collection or different pieces. And then over time, I kind of felt like this, uh, as I was exposed to more systematic ways to approach it, to kind of organize it, that I found it was really helpful. So this is one in particular that kind of going through these steps or sort of even whether it's really formally or relatively informally, I feel like kind of can help me wrap my arms around evaluation. It also can be a nice centering way to talk about evaluation. So just really quickly, you know, this idea of engaging stakeholders. So that can be, you know, individuals who are going to use the information that you have, who's going to make decisions based on the data you collect, who's collecting the data, you know, the program implementers, different people, uh, those who are affected by the evaluation, all of those groups can be um, really helpful in making sure um, that you have an evaluation that really is responsive to the needs of the program, needs of decision makers, it's gonna make a difference. So even though that engaging stakeholders is the first step, it can happen throughout the program. Um, describing the program, making sure that everybody who's participating in the process has a real clear understanding of what it is that the program is intended to accomplish, what are the different pieces, um, you know, that can be something that if you don't, I know there was somebody who's talking about writing a grant um, or doing program design, coordinating program, you know, making sure that there's a real clarity about what are all the program pieces and what are your either initial outcomes, longer term, out, middle term or longer term outcomes. Um, and whether you have a logic model or a theory of change, those are really nice pieces to have very clear so that you can understand and all your stakeholders, there's some agreement on that. Um, focusing the evaluation design is really what are your priority evaluation questions and what is the best way to approach uh, data collection to get real actionable answers to those questions. And then at the bottom here is this gathering credible evidence. I think we often think of evidence and data as the heart of evaluation, and it is. But in this process, it, this framework, it's part of a process. So, you know, going out and gathering that data that's going to be reliable and meaningful to your stakeholders. And then justifying the conclusions, which is kind of a fancy uh, frame of a way of saying, you know, analyzing those data, triangulating data across multiple sources, making sure you're really confident um, in your conclusions and that it's transparent how you got there. 
And then finally, this is the gold standard for evaluation, ensuring that you're using the findings, sharing the lessons that you've learned. Um, you know, there are evaluators who say that that's really the key question to evaluate the quality of an evaluation is what you've learned being used and shared with others. And so um, that's kind of the framework in a nutshell. Um, when we developed this process, we had envisioned three Seri a series of three learning sessions. And we were gonna really focus this one on data use, uh, sharing lessons learned, um, but we can talk about anything that strikes people's fancy um, in this session. So um, I would say first I'd pause, are there any questions or comments about this framework? Um, helpful, not so helpful. <laughs> Hi, Teresa, go ahead. You just said a whole bunch of great stuff. I, I'm working on two monitors here and I'm just getting new, so I know it doesn't look, it looks funny. Anyways, I'm looking at it. But you said a whole bunch of good information. Is there going to be a transcript of what you're, what you're sharing today? Or you're, this is being recorded and we can come back and look at it later? Yes, I think there is. Go ahead, Nicole Young. You can talk to that better than I can. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's being recorded and it takes us uh, at least a few days to get it ready and shareable, um, but we'll share this with the slides. Um, and we don't usually share like an actual transcript of the, but you, of the session, but if you want that, I will just say that I think you could, sorry, I'm looking at the, in the captions option in your Zoom meeting control bar, you might have to click the three dots where it says more. Oh, right. And then caption. View, view full transcript. And then you can actually, and then you can actually save, you should be able to save the transcript if you, if you want to keep a copy of that before you leave the meeting. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a yeah. lot. I would also say at the very, it's tiny on the screen, maybe it's bigger in the slides. And I have uh, created a Padlet too with a lot of these resources that we can share with you. But this particular uh, cdc.gov evaluation index website has like lots of links to this article. Like there's an original article that was published around this. People have um, developed some kind of uh, little guidelines for each of those different steps. So it's pretty well, it's been around for a while and it is, um, again, it's kind of based on this program theory driven evaluation design that's out there. Stuart Donaldson is one person, but there's a lot of additional resources around this um, if that's something that, that really strikes your fancy. And I have personally found this just so helpful. Um, and like, if I'm doing a formal evaluation, you know, I kind of have all of these steps in my mind when I do the evaluation plan um, to kind of guide me in that process. Are there other comments or I'm gonna ask a, um, oh, Eva, if you're having mic, oh, that was your earlier mic issues. If you, if you have a question or a comment that you wanna type in the chat, we'll also try and be mindful of that. I know tech issues can be really tough. Um, so are there are other comments. I have a question for the group too. Once we, if there are, if there aren't other comments or questions, so if we're really thinking about um, this last piece around ensuring data use and sharing lessons learned, are there particular um, favorite lessons learned or strategies that you've used in this process? Anybody on the call? And if there aren't particular lessons learned, are there any particular challenges people are interested in discussing? Okay, I'm I have one. <laughs> I have one like oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I know for myself, I often, um, find that like in the planning stages of, you know, evaluation, sometimes it's hard to, um, not go overboard with like the amount of data because there's always kind of this, well, what if, and, and so like, sometimes that can be challenging, but then, uh, when it gets to the stage of ensuring use, ensuring lessons from the data, from the findings, sometimes like if, if you, or if I haven't done like a really good job of really defining, okay, what are the questions we're trying to answer and what data do we need to be collecting to do that? Sometimes I could still end up with either, oh shoot, we didn't ask enough questions or the right questions. So our, we've got some holes in the findings or like, gosh, we asked so many things, we collected so much data and it's just, it becomes overwhelming to think about like, how do I actually distill that and synthesize it and communicate it in a way that then becomes um, easily understood by different audiences and then that they feel like there's some kind of action or something to do with the data. Um, so I'm not, I guess I'm not even sure what my question is there other than, <laughs> do well, you have, you know, uh... I, I think that's such a common, you know, it's kind of like at the beginning, we're always just like, oh, I want to know this, that, and the other thing. And then, um, you know, I feel like when I'm working with clients, sometimes, you know, there'll be different people in the organization that want to know different things. Like the board may want to understand, you know, impacts <laughs> in a particular way. And then there may be, you know, a program manager that wants to understand maybe nearer term outcomes. And then there's a staff person who like wants to know, I don't know, you know, like everything from the temperature of the room to, you know, our, our people, um, you know, how to understand, you know, just kind of program delivery kinds of questions. And so I think, you know, it is kind of trying to, to bring people together and be really um, prioritizing those evaluation questions. And I think um, sometimes trying to predict into the future, like, okay, <laughs> one is that if the program were functioning really, really well, what would we be able to, you know, see, observe <laughs> in some kind of way? And what is the best way to get the data, most succinct data that's the least burdensome on participants or, you know, people collecting the data, people analyzing the data, um, and really trying to be very disciplined to those evaluation questions from the beginning. And sometimes um, one thing that I found really helpful, like if I'm developing a, like a survey or a focus group guide or whatever it is, you know, kind of trying to map that back to those questions. And then when you send it out to people who then start adding things, it might be, the challenge might be say, okay, so what do we take away? You know, and then that kind of sometimes can oblige people to prioritize, you know, what, what it is that you're asking. So I think um, those are some things. And then I'm also thinking of, um, that idea of sometimes starting the evaluation, like as it's taking shape to think about what does your report look like? Um, and um, sorry, I feel like I'm name dropping, but Jane Davidson, who's a wonderful, has this very succinct approach to evaluation. She's just like, don't produce an evaluation report that is just so full of details that, you know, you could get lost and you kind of read through the evaluation. You're like, none the wiser as to whether the program accomplished its key outcomes. So it's kind of trying not to be overly descriptive and be like, we're really trying to get to the heart of outcomes, I think. I don't know if that's helpful, but um, I think, yeah, it's just kind of thinking about all that upfront um, and also the evaluation of the evaluation. You know, when you get to the end and you're just like looking at, you're like, oh, wow, this question gave us like if it's a qualitative thing, all sorts of information, but it wasn't really necessary or useful. It was kind of in the nice, but not necessary category. And then the next time around, trying to be a little bit more lean in the approach. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, and that, dis that discipline is so important. 
the discipline. And the other thing that I kind of like doing, I've, I've kind of started doing more of it is um, in my reporting is kind of leading with the key findings first, you know, instead of kind of doing that whole, I'm going to walk you through all of my methods. I'm going to walk you through all of the granular information. And then I'm going to tell you my big findings and my recommendations. It's like, here's, here's really the piece. That's the most, the key, the key five messages or four or three or whatever it is. And then you you provide all of that stuff, but it's just like in terms of sequencing. And sometimes that will help me be a little bit more, has helped me that practice, I, I think has helped me be a little bit more disciplined in thinking about data collection and analysis. Oh, Teresa? I really like what you said, and I was thinking about um, the last county supervisor meeting that um, the city of Santa Cruz, the, the Santa Cruz County had, and uh, one of the one of the supervisors was seeing the people who presented the court grant to get approval for it to be released or the RFP. But uh, he was like, "We would like to see the nonprofit organizations are applying." Uh, for this RFP and this grant. And I was thinking, uh, with the grant writers, we would like to know who the audience is, right? Like who we're writing to in particular because of what you were just saying. Like uh, I've seen the last organization that I worked for, they were writing grants and the verbiage was so, um, so it was to a private school, high school philanthropy group was going to be reading this information. And I was like, that is way too much data for these little high school students to even comprehend, which is probably why uh, you've applied for it multiple years in a row and haven't received it. But, uh, you know, it's the grant writer also like us seeing who is going to read the grant. So we know how much data to include in the grant and what's really important, what they're going to be able to completely digest and understand and what they're not. Um, and According to the context in the meeting, it sounds like it's a, a bunch of different community members that are going to be putting committees that will go over the core grant um, to see which nonprofits are going to be granted this award. So it's almost like uh, exactly what I think it was Nicole was sharing the less is better and just make sure that whatever you're writing has a punch to it. So that it's digestible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's so much in that comment, Teresa. Thank you for sharing. Because one of my first thoughts too was when you were talking about, you know, people asking for certain kinds of data, like on, on one end, you know, when we think about our audiences and or as evaluators, when we're like thinking about what data to collect, it's like really understanding like why are you collecting particular kinds of data and what's the utility of them? You know, what do that, how do they kind of fit into that um, piece of, of sharing information and of like what's credible ed evidence too, you know, that's in that six step model. So, you know, what is your audience? You talked about the high school students, what's credible evidence for them, um, you know, might look a little different and what's compelling for them might be different. Um, and I also think like, you know, we, um, if we're whether we're writing a grant or we're managing a program or we're whatever it is we're doing as evaluators, we are like, sometimes we have just this wealth of information and we want to share it all. <laughs> like, I know that's my kind of uh, uh, sort of orientation, you know, it's just like, let me tell you everything I know. And then being sort of thinking about, again, what are the priority questions? What's your audience? What are their, you know, information needs and kind of tailoring it to them. Like, you don't, you obviously want to be transparent and, you know, uh, faithful to the data, but there's only so much information people can absorb. Um, so kind of prioritizing that and particularly, again, that discipline to your evaluation questions can be really helpful with that. Um, so, yeah, thanks. That's it's a challenge, too, when you're a grant writer to try and distill everything down into, you know, however many, um, however much space you have for whatever um funding source that you're applying for. One of the things that I've 
um, seen some of the organizations I work with do with their evaluation reports, uh, and so often I'm I'm helping them write them or contributing to them, is um, they like to have what they consider more like the technical evaluation report that really, because it helps them to have that detail somewhere, um, especially if there's like different people at different times, like different staff at different times or different you know, people on the evaluation team at different times, it helps create that consistency in terms of the methodology and how findings are described. But then that can be used in different ways, depending on who the audience is, whether it's that then you're trying to use some of the data and outcomes to incorporate into a grant application or you want to take some of your data and findings and turn them into social media posts, you know, because obviously you're not going to write <laughs> a whole lengthy technical, <laughs> you know, uh, document. So it's, um, uh, it's, I, I always like it when I see that because it's kind of a, a nice way to find that balance between, okay, like the, the detail can live somewhere. Um, and then it's a matter of like, okay, how do you use that and almost like translate it? right, into different formats or different, um, you know, different ways of describing it or visualizing it, depending on who your audience is. Yeah, I love that idea, because I think it is, um, you know, there was at some point in time where people are like, oh, I don't want a written report that sits on a shelf, this dusty, complicated, overly detailed thing. On the other hand, if you are an evaluator or program manager, or you're trying to kind of keep that continuity over time, like having that level of detail is so helpful. But so I don't want to do away with that. But I think you're right. It's not sufficient in and of itself. So, you know, maybe there's the social media or the infographic. I love people that are able to kind of pull out those pieces of, you know, quantitative and qualitative data and just make something super punchy that, you know, somebody can really understand what are the key take-home messages. Um, I think the executive summary can be really nice on one of those longer reports for if you have somebody who wants a little technical, but not the whole shebang, like that's also really useful. Um, but yeah, again, like anytime you can pull those findings out and disseminate them um, in a format that people, um, that works for for different audiences, I think is great. I'm also a big fan of attaching, whether it's like in a, an electronic drive or the report itself, like the the tools, like the data collection tools, whether it's the survey, you know, PDF of the survey or the um, focus group prompts or those kinds of things, I think can be really helpful. Um, you know, again, kind of archiving um, the methods in that particular way and not just describing them in detail. I think for me, and I don't know if people have good tips for this, but one of the things that I feel like can be most difficult is, okay, you've, you've created this evaluation report in whatever forms it takes, and there may be some recommendations, and maybe you've discussed those as a team, and then it isn't necessarily as an evaluator, your job to implement those things, and so sometimes kind of following up with an agency or making sure that those um, evaluation findings kind of stay alive and get addressed along the course of the program or get shared with similar programs. Like, I think that can be um, challenging. And I don't know if people have encountered that or find, have great tips around that. Um, Did you mean like finding the data that you need uh, can be overwhelming? No, it's more like once you've created your evaluation report, you have your findings. And then ideally, we'd like to see those findings used to maybe adjust a program a little bit or, you know, help design a future program that's similar. And so sometimes I feel like people, you know, when they're managing their programs or implementing them, they're like, oh, that's great. That's really useful. And then I never hear another word about whether they actually have applied any of those findings in the program going forward. Um, and some of my clients will do like, uh, they'll do like a, almost like a spreadsheet or a little 
checklist of this was the finding, this is what we're going to do. And this is when, when we've done it. And that can be really nice. Um, but sometimes I feel like personally as an evaluator, because I often do external evaluations, I don't have much control what happens to the findings after they're released. For me, uh, usually in a grant, we, when, you, when I write a grant, they'll ask um, in the annual report after they are the yearly evaluation after they've granted the money. So they'll say, uh, okay, so what was the difference in the impact between last year and this year? And that's when I'll get to see, like, oh, yeah, they, they used this grant to with the data that I provided, and this is what this is what it did. And so, but as a grant writer, that's usually the only place that I get to see that it's the, <laughs> the data and how much uh, it's made an impact in the community since the previous year. Yeah. So, so sometimes those of us in that helping role, whether it's a grant writer or uh, an evaluator, like we can we can't control what happens with that information. I think in the tips section, there's a few things I feel like that you can do that kind of encourage that, that make it more likely that people will use it. And so those might be about, you know, how you report it, how you engage stakeholders, making sure you're answering the questions that are important to them and that kind of thing. Um, so. Anything? else people want to bring up we could we can dive into some of these tips if we want to do that next I could ask um one question that's always you know depending on the the grant is how we decide to move forward with it but um and when I say we I guess it's me <laughs> we don't have a grant writer um but I have support from my national team. But with regard to evaluation and data collection and all of that, we do it at, at a national level and have all of that evidence, you know, based information. But and then, you know, um, that's a much more robust report that we have. Right. And we do, of course, follow our, our local information. But as far as the evidence-based proof and everything, it's calculated at as a national level. So do you guys have any suggestions for how to, of course, speak to that, right? But why why and how to bring that more into our, you know, community-based um, population when approaching the core grant? Um, Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I, I, I'm I not exactly sure. So one question I would have, so you have sort of, it's like at the national level, like data collection, like the, the, what the questions that are asked and you collect information locally. And then do you get a report back of your results particularly? Um, yes. Like yes, sort of. Um, but it's they mo they mostly evaluate it at a at a national level um, because that's what's going into all the research that's been done. They're evaluating as a program whole, mm -hmm. which is how we usually report it. But I just you know we have our own system of tracking, but we're not doing you know the the studies that are being done are being done at institutions, you know, in other states and stuff. Yeah. So I can't speak particularly for like the core grant. I would say like in general, I think that when you can show evidence that your program is functioning or the kinds of outcomes it's achieved, like that's that's always a, a, an important thing for, you know, reviewing. I, um, you know, it's an important thing for a program. Um, I, I would say, and others like chime in, um, or maybe others should chime in. I. I I actually think like if you could get some of your sort of more local, like if your national organization, you know, if they would give you a report of what, how you, 
what you've achieved or how you stack up against some of those other, um, you know, kind of national partners, like that might be really interesting just for your own benefit and whether that's something useful in applying for funding um, is, is, is also, you know, could be interesting. It might just be interesting to see, um, mm -hmm. you know, are you achieving the same kinds of outcomes that one would expect for a program um, that's being delivered, you know, anywhere, or are your outcomes a little better in some places, or maybe not as strong in others, and are there things you can do to adjust that? So, um, but it is really nice to have like a national organization that's putting together some um, validated questions and and kind of guiding that process. Um, but it's also really nice to have your local program data. Other people's thoughts on um, Liz's question. Thank you. So I, um, and Nicole, do you wanna display maybe the slides? We have a few um, tips that we put together. Um, and I think we've talked about a lot of these. Um, so this is that idea, you know, that I think a little bit on several people's questions, Nicole Young's question when I was um, thinking about, you know, how do you focus your design is kind of that like idea of how will these data be used in our program or practice to make it to improve it. Or sometimes the evaluation will tell you, you are you are on the right path, keep on doing what you're doing. It's working really well. Um, you know, even really strong programs might have areas for improvement, um, but sometimes an evaluation can can be a good confirmation um, that things are working well. Um, the stakeholder piece, I think, is so important. Getting those decision makers in at the beginning, staff, you want them um, involved as well. Um, some agencies are set up really well, may have an advisory group um, to get people uh clients, consumers involved, um, or people affected by the program or evaluation involved at the beginning. If not, you may have opportunities like when you're piloting um, different tools to make sure that those are have the right kind of reading level, are the right, um, the questions, you're getting the kinds of answers that you might anticipate it. So sometimes um, involving program participants in that kind of piloting can be really useful. Um, you know, the other thing about this engaging stakeholders, it's around like buy-in and people appreciating um, and uh, the evaluation itself, like, and having some confidence in the findings. So kind of giving people those chances throughout is really helpful. Um, focus, important, actionable information. I think we talked about that as well. You know, there's a million questions we can ask. So how do we really... Um, focus on those things that that we can use um, to make our programs better. Uh, next slide. Um, this one around reporting and timelines for information needs. So sometimes, you know, when we have access to our program participants might be on a certain time in the calendar year. Our funders may need reports at a different time in the calendar year or if we're applying for grants, you know, there's all of those pieces. So if you're designing an evaluation, you might wanna ask your decision makers or your grant writers or your program planners, when are the times that they need information? If it doesn't coincide exactly with kind of when you have access to participants, um, you may want to think about preliminary analyses, um, and those can be a good idea in any case, but, you know, to kind of give people what they need <laughs> when they need it, and then you may have to circle back. Um, but that's really important for ensuring use, is knowing when those decisions are going to happen and um, try and get people the data that they need to make them or inform them. This idea of preliminary findings, a second bullet, I think is also can be really useful mid-program. So if you've collected some early data and you're getting results that might suggest there's a need to align the program um, or you know meeting those funded uh, recommendations and so on, it might be nice to share those in the interim. Um, if you make a program adjustment based on evaluation findings, that's a good thing, <laughs> even if it's not all the way at the end of the program. And when you're doing your final report, you know, you can also mention that um, if that's something that happened. Um, you know, I've had programs where there just were uh, 
pieces of, of the program that weren't being delivered, for example. And so that we were seeing kind of some strange results and then it was just kind of a, a set of crossed wires about when things would be happening. So that was a really useful time to share um, those preliminary findings. I think the other piece around lessons learned um, is this idea of avoiding any surprises in your final reports. So it's part of that stakeholder engagement piece. It's part of being transparent. I think, um, you know, you want to be communicating with um, your stakeholders as you go along. And I think it's also, you know, you don't want to be like presenting at a board meeting and people have no idea what's in those reports that can catch people really flat footed. And um, if you have kind of difficult um, news there that they are unsurprised, it can create lots of critiques of the evaluation or some defensiveness. Um, so I think it's really a great idea that people kind of have a general sense of what's going on in the evaluation as it's unfolding. And again, people may have different points of view on that. I don't know if anybody has had that experience around um, sharing preliminary findings or at least hinting at them. Um, Okay, so next slide then. Um, we talked a lot about different report formats. Um, that's great. Um, that really keeping those reports succinct where you can and focusing on findings. Um, and then the data visualization piece we didn't talk about. I think someone earlier mentioned, um, you know, when you have like all of this abundant data and where you focus your attention, um, I think data visualizations can are so important. First of all, they can also be really, really powerful. Sometimes that might be the only thing that people remember in an entire report, or sometimes you'll see like a visualization that's picked up and used in other places. And so really making sure that any data that you visualize, like the message is clear, that it's kind of nicely described in the topic um, heading and that it's really balanced, like that you don't, um, that you just kind of want to follow those data visualization best practices. And in the resources, there are a couple of people, Stephanie Evergreen is great. Anything she does, I think is great. Um, we also have uh, a resource around um, data and equity considerations. So those things are kind of, there's a checklist, I think in that one, that's really useful. So um, that would be my other, uh, big encouragement is to really pay attention to those um, data visualizations. And those are the two resources that I was just mentioning. So the one on the left, that's at Stephanie Evergreen's website. And that's really about building some different kinds of visualizations in Excel. If you follow her website, there's a whole host of um, good information there. Um, and then this applying equity awareness and data visualization guide, the do no harm guide. Um, there's a really nifty checklist in there. There's lots of, it's a pretty dense uh, resource. There's lots of good information in that as well. And I think that's that's everything that I have prepared. We do have a Padlet that we'll send with some more research resources. Um, other comments or questions before we get ready to wrap up? This was a really good meeting. Thank you so much. That was my comment. Oh, thank you. Yeah, really informative, really light, really easy to absorb everything. So thank you so much. And then uh, I have a question just again. Did you say it would be a couple of days for us to be able to uh, get a copy of this recording? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we have to go through a few steps to edit the videos and make sure everything is um, uh, meets the Americans with Disabilities Act standards for accessibility. So it takes us a little bit of time to do that. And by us, I mean Tusella. <laughs> Tusella on our team does that uh, and does a fabulous job, but yeah, it takes a little bit of time. So I think in these slides, I've got just a couple minutes left here. And so I'm going to share a, a couple pieces of information. Uh, we do, if for those of you that are uh, data lovers and want to keep learning more, uh, or if you've heard about data share or experimented with data share, but want to learn more, uh, we have another event coming up 
this coming Tuesday, the 28th, on using community indicators for planning and public policy. So it's an opportunity to both get kind of oriented to and familiar with data share and then do some practice. Uh, and we're actually going to use, and Eva will be one of the, Eva Holt who's on here, I think she got back onto the call, is um, one of the co-presenters who will help kind of show how data share and the data that's on data share can be both a, a, a way to find data that can be useful to you for program planning, grant writing, policy advocacy, uh, but it also can be a place to showcase data that um, either if you're part of a collaborative and want to uh, kind of highlight some of the community level data that your collaborative has been tracking. So it's both a place to get data as well as showcase data. Um, and so I encourage you to sign up for that uh, event if you're interested in that. And um, Tuesday's event is going to be showcasing a recent um, data spotlight. I'm not sure if I'm using the right term for that, uh, on that the Women's Commission recently produced with Eva's help. And so that will be a really uh, interesting example of how data share can be used. And then some of you have mentioned, you're aware that June 3rd, the core investments request for proposals or RFP will be officially released. Um, so we are uh, going to start the training and technical assistance uh, that's specific to the core RFP. We'll start that basically throughout the months of June and, and July. Uh, the first structured training that we're going to do is one on developing a theory of change and logic model with an equity lens. We don't yet have that uh, registration link active, but I wanted to just uh, mention it today as kind of a save the date and time. So, cause that's something that's, you know, that training won't be again, specific to the questions in the core application, but it's another helpful piece in terms of how to get ready to write your proposal or how to kind of check and update and refresh any of your um, planning materials before you start writing a proposal. So encourage you to check that out uh, and then just stay tuned for more details. Uh, about the full training and technical assistance schedule. There will be a combination of structured trainings where we actually present content and provide some tools and, and even hands-on practice during the training. Uh, so that's what I mean by structured training, a uh, combination of office hours that are almost like this format where it's more like bring your questions uh, and it's open to anybody um, where we won't necessarily have a presentation ready, but just as a chance to, to ask and get answers to questions. And then we'll also be offering some individual TA sessions, like kind of, uh, it'll be one of us, the core consultants, either me, Nicole Lezen, or Crystal Caballero, uh, who is one of the newer members of our core consulting team, where, um, you as an applicant can actually have up to two individual TA sessions with one of us. And so we'll be sending an announcement pretty soon about how you can sign up for any and all of that. So just keep an eye out for that. Also keep an eye out for, in a different email, uh, the Court Institute survey that we're going to be releasing where we want to get uh, feedback from folks that have been attending court institute events help us it'll help us think about what's been working well what could be even better what are some uh, other needs when it comes to training and capacity building um, so that survey link uh, is almost ready to be released so again keep an eye out for that and I uh, just want to thank you for being here today and, and participating in the discussion. We would love to get your feedback about today's uh, peer learning circle and uh, today's discussion. And so Giselle has put the links to that feedback survey in the chat, uh, or if you have a camera uh, on your phone and want to scan one of the QR codes, you can answer that feedback survey in either English or Spanish. And that is it for today. Thank you, Jane, for facilitating uh, such a great conversation. And thank you, Gisela and Oscar, for providing our meeting support.